Uh, my name is Max. This is my colleague, Greg, and we are both program managers on our billing support team. So what do we have in store for this session? Well, we'll start with an overview of resource organization and access management. We'll talk about what that is, why it's important, what resources are involved, and how those resources relate to one another. We'll then spend some time taking a look at each resource in a little bit more detail, as well as the key roles that are necessary to uh, uh, manage those resources, and share some of those key configuration best practices to think about when you're actually setting those up. We'll then take a little bit of time and look at an example of how the organization of those resources, as well as the role assignments, will evolve over time for an organization that's growing in size. And then we'll wrap up. Uh, we don't have a ton of time to talk to you all today and cover this content in the detail that we would like. And so we're going to point you to some key documentation that will go into a lot more detail, a lot more depth um, that you guys can use with your teams after the fact and actually step by step go through uh, this process um, when you're configuring your accounts. Resource organization and access management. It's a bit of a mouthful, so we're just going to refer to this as resource management for simplicity. OK, resource management. What is this? Uh, in the context of cloud, uh, the term resource is thrown around a lot. You've probably heard it here at the conference. Um, we, felt, we felt it would be pretty helpful to define what we mean by resource and resource management, first by talking about what we don't mean. In the context of GCP, when, when people hear the term resource, they often think of those service resources that are used to process your workloads, your VMs, your databases, all of the underlying products and services that you consume using GCP. But that's not really what we're talking about. When we talk about resource management, we're talking about the resources that sit above those services, the ones that are involved in actually uh, managing and uh, configuring your accounts, such as those that you see here. Now, I want to note that we're not explicitly talking about or looking at these resources through the lens of cost management, which is you know, such as how you, how you can or should be organizing your various resources, your projects, your folders, your labels, um, for purposes of separating out and tracking your various cost considerations. That's a super important topic and one that's really well covered by our colleague James in his session on resource organization for cost management, which he gave yesterday. Um, so if you didn't get a chance to uh, check that one out, that's totally fine. That session and all the other ones will be available on YouTube after next. And we highly encourage you to check that one out because it's actually a really nice compliment that we want to cover here. Our purposes in this session are to um, give you some prescriptive guidance on how you should be thinking about these resources and the roles that are associated with them uh, so that you can configure your account and, and maintain uh, you know, good account hygiene. That's really our purpose here. So why is this important? Um, con not configuring an account correctly can lead to some really common and problematic states that impact your team's ability to use GCP. Uh, you may be wondering, why are we up here you know, from, from the support team talking to you about account configuration and, and resource setup? The reason for that is when customers don't do those things correctly, it, it often imp impacts their, their billing, their invoicing, their payments, and then they reach out to the billing support team for help. Uh, so we're really well positioned to see all the different ways that this can go wrong uh, based on the upstream decisions that our customers are making. So we thought we were in a good place to provide some of this guidance, right, and sort of fill in those gaps when you are making those decisions to sort of guide you through that. It's pretty telling here, actually, that about a third of all of the customer cases, the customer inquiries coming into the billing support team are related in some way to resource management. So it's super common, affects really large customers and really small customers as well. What's at stake? What happens if you don't do this correctly? What can actually go wrong? Um, these problems with resource management can manifest in a number of ways, ranging from an inability to retrieve information from your accounts uh, to changing settings on your resources, billing accounts, projects, um, to losing access to those, those resources completely, all the way up to uh, disruption of service and termination of your account, which unfortunately is actually happening. Um, oftentimes, though, it's some combination of these things. It's a you know, garbled mess of problems sort of stack on top of each other. And to fix them requires sort of untangling this you know, ball of yarn. So we thought the best way to address these issues was to help you avoid them to begin with. All right, so let's zoom out a little bit and take a look at these resources and how they relate to each other in this uh, resource hierarchy. Starting at the top in the red boxes, we have the domain and the organization. 
These things collectively create this sort of umbrella that lets you more easily manage your users as well as your resources within the organization. In the green box, we have the billing account, which is responsible for tracking all of your, your charges that you're accruing as you use GCP services uh, and helps define how you pay for those services in combination with the payment profile, which is the yellow box over there to the left. Um, uniquely, the payment profile is not a cloud-level resource. It sits outside of that resource hierarchy. Um, and it is responsible for, among other things, uh, holding and actually containing your payment instruments. So if you use a credit card or a debit card, that would reside within your payment profile. Lastly, we have the blue boxes, projects, folders, and labels. And collectively, you can think of these things as this flexible mechanism that helps you manage not only your cost, but also your access to the various underlying services that you're going to be using. All right, so let's dig into these a little bit more. And I want to start by noting uh, each, of, each of your teams, each of your companies is going to have various considerations when you're setting up your account and setting up these resources. Business considerations, financial, legal, organizational, that's totally fine. Um, those things are going to influence the way that you actually, you know, uh, the decisions you make when you're actually configuring and setting this stuff up. What we want to focus on is providing you with some common best practices and a general order of operations that you should be thinking about when you configure these resources. Um, everyone's is going to look different, but there are some, you know, some common things that we want to encourage you to do. In this section, we'll introduce each resource. We'll talk about what are those key configuration details and best practices are, and we will introduce the core roles that are necessary to manage each one. So let's start with domains and organizations. Like we said, together these create this umbrella under which all of your uh, cloud resources are nested. It helps you manage those resources and your users. These things are different, domains and orgs, but they map on a one-to-one -one basis. So you can sort of think about them as two sides of the same coin. A good way to conceptually break these out is think about domain as the mechanism to manage your users and the organization is the mechanism to manage your resources, as well as the access to the resources. Starting with domains, um, in the same way that your web domain sort of names your website, your, your domain in the context of cloud names your organization. And it's at this level that you can define that directory of users that you have within your organization. You can enforce uh, universal policy across those users, such as two-factor authentication, uh, and you can even help your users recover access to their accounts if they you know, lose access and they need to reset their password, for example. All that stuff can be managed within the Google Admin Console. When you create a domain, that will automatically create your organization, like I said, one-to-one. -one. We'll talk about how to do that in a moment. On the organization side, you can think about this as that root node in your GCP hierarchy. Um, and it's by virtue of this that you have control all of, over all of those subordinate resources that sit underneath uh, the org. Um, this is really important for a couple reasons. The first one is proactive management. So if your company is expanding, uh, if you're going to acquire another company, if you're going to spin up a new division, um, if you didn't have a organization, you would have to individually communicate and coordinate between all of the individual resource owners to achieve some larger vision. If you had an organization, it makes that really easy because you can sort of quarterback those changes from a central point, uh, and that goes really quickly. The second reason it's really important is for reactive management. If you have a really important project that you're working on and only a single employee, key employee that's managing that project, and they win the lottery and you know, never come into work again, you're kind of out of luck if you don't have an organization. You have to get in touch with them, you know, sort of beg them to add somebody else to the project. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a mess. If you had an organization, it sort of functions as an insurance policy. It allows you to really easily go back in there and uh, assign that project to another person on your team. All of this stuff uh, with the organization is related to your GCP resources. So logically, you can, you can control that using the GCP console. So how do we create this? What do we, what do we, uh, how should we think about sort of setting this stuff up? The first best practice that we have for you all is to use a domain in an organization. It's completely voluntary. There's no, uh, you know, no, no forcing that you have to, forcing you to actually use one of these things. So um, we want to encourage you to use it. There's not really good reason not to, based on what we just discussed. So to set up a domain and an organization, you'll start by creating the domain. You have a couple options to do this. You can use G Suite, or you can use Cloud Identity. We won't go into the details of these, um, but you have a couple options here, which is great. One of them is free. Uh, once you've set that up, the next step will be to provision your users. And you have a couple options here as well. You can do this individually at the Google Admin Console, 
or you can use a tool which we would suggest if you have a, a large uh, user base already, Cloud Direct Resync, uh, if you want to import a bunch of users and provision them en masse. Once you've set that up, you'll sort of shift focus over to the organization. Like we said, domain will, when you create your domain, it will automatically create your organization. So you'll shift over to that GCP console, and you will migrate any projects that you've been using if you've happened to be using GCP prior to setting up your org. Projects and billing accounts. Um, here again, if you have a large number of resources that you're going to be migrating, we highly suggest you use the organization setup wizard to streamline that process. OK, lastly, um, so at this point, you'll have your domain. You'll have your org, you'll have your users, you'll have your resources. Now you're going to sort of connect the dots and grant permissions for those, uh, for those resources to those users. And here we want to, we want to call this out, really important tip. Um, by default, I believe the billing account creator rolls on for your organization, for everyone within it. We want to strongly encourage you to, to remove that, to turn that off. And the reason for that is... Um, it will lead to a proliferation of billing accounts if you don't do that, and it becomes really problematic. And we see a lot of different ways that this goes wrong. Um, there's not really a good reason that, to have that turned on. You want to restrict the access to who is able to create billing accounts because of all the tie-ins to other uh, resources like payment profiles, which we'll discuss in a moment. Um, and it's best to sort of just get ahead of that and remove it. So what are the key roles involved in setting up and managing your domain and organization? On the domain side, we have the super admin. This person has the ability to administer that directory of users. They are the person that will recover accounts. If uh, any of your users lose access, they get locked out. They can reset those passwords. Uh, they can also enforce that sort of uh, domain-wide policy like 2FA. And they can grant the org admin privilege. On the other side, with the organization, we have the org, uh, org admin. This person has the ability to administer all of those resources. They're also the individual that will do that migration. That becomes necessary. And it's worth noting that by default, the first domain super admin, the person that actually sets up the domain, will also be the first org admin. Um, and uh, a couple of notes on who typically fills these roles within an organization. It could be very different, depending on the size of the organization. When you're first starting out, very common to have the same individual across both of these roles, someone that has you know, IT responsibilities for your, for your team, for your company. As organizations get larger, typically we see org admins will sort of peel off from that and might be someone more directly involved in the use of cloud services at your company. It could be a CTO, head of product, head of, head of engineering, something like that. Quick note on roles. Um, this applies not only to the roles we just discussed, but also the ones that we're, we're going to discuss for the other resources. Um, avoid single points of failure. Like that situation that we just talked about with the employee that wins the lotto and, uh, and never comes back. Um, it's a good idea to assign multiple uh, individuals to these key roles, especially administrator roles, and practice what we're calling reasonable redundancy. Um, that's sort of half the battle. You also want to make sure that every, all of your other individual, all the other people on your team know who those administrators are, because they oftentimes have special privileges and, and permissions and access uh, within your company and within GCP. And so they sort of function as this first line of defense when problems come up, and they can help troubleshoot. So it's really important. We see this all the time in larger organizations. Um, people don't know who the billing admin is. People don't know who the, the org admin is. And then they're coming to support, and it creates this sort of like telephone game. And it's, it's, it gets pretty, pretty complicated. And then lastly, we know, we know teams change, we know companies evolve, people leave, and people come in. And so, you know, sort of kick the tires on this roles and permissions list every six months uh, or every quarter even to make sure that's up to date. All right, billing accounts. So as we said before, the billing account is responsible for containing all of your, your charges, tracking all of your charges from the usage of your GCP services. And it's all those charges that hit that billing account that ultimately make its way onto your invoice. Um, so there's one invoice for every billing account that you have. The uh, billing account also is responsible for defining how you'll pay for that invoice in combination with the payment profile, which we'll discuss shortly. Uh, and like all of the other resources we're talking about, has its own roles and permissions. And that's, that's kind of the core reason, one of the core reasons why things get really dicey when setting this stuff up. Because if you're doing it in a silo, um, in a way that's not really paying attention to how you're configuring your other resources and who you're putting in those key roles, it creates a lot of confusion um, within you know, customers' companies. Also important to note here that uh, billing accounts can only operate in a single currency per billing account. 
So how should you configure a billing account? The first step is to decide how many billing accounts you need. And this is kind of a trick point because we want to strongly encourage you to have only a single billing account. That will be appropriate for the vast majority of our customers and probably most of the folks in this room. Um, we see oftentimes customers will use multiple billing accounts as sort of a hack for cost management if they want to separate out costs. Uh, but we have other great resources like projects, folders, and labels that we should really be relying on for the heavy lifting for all of our cost management practices and let billing accounts kind of just be billing accounts. There are a couple situations where it does make sense to have multiple billing accounts. If you operate uh, separate legal entities, if you operate in different geographies and different currencies, in those cases it will make sense and you will need to have separate billing accounts. But otherwise, um, keep it to one. The reason for that, again, with a proliferation of billing accounts, it creates a lot of overhead to make sure that you're, you're tracking things correctly, that you have permission syncs correctly. Um, if you have preferential pricing, you know, it creates a lot of problems there. So we, we strongly suggest keep it to one. Cool. All right, so first step is deciding how many you need, but also making sure that it's just one. Uh, the second step is defining and creating that billing account. Um, so if you've already been using GCP, you can choose the one that's going to be the primary one. If you haven't, great. Set up your, your, your main one. Call that your primary. At this point, we want to call out as well, uh, turn on or enable BigQuery billing export on day one when you, when you create your billing account. You can't do this retroactively, and so to make sure that you have uh, as much data as possible that you have access to, it's always a good idea to turn it on as soon as you've created the account. Next, you're going to migrate any resources, any uh, projects specifically, over to this billing account uh, that you may have been using previously. And then lastly, you're going to settle any final balances that you have on older billing accounts you are no longer planning on using and close them down. We've seen this quite a bit where a customer will have you know, a stray billing account with a single project attached to it, a little bit of usage, and you know, the, the credit card associated with that one sort of lapses, and then it creates uh, you know, account closure you know, protocols, and that has a domino effect that ends up affecting their other live billing accounts. And so it's, it's really best to just shut those down if you have any extra ones and just focus on that primary billing account. All right, key roles in managing your billing account. So the billing account administrator is going to be the primary role here. This person has the ability to manage those payment instruments. Uh, they can enable BigQuery export, like we just talked about, as a best practice. They can view costs. They can um, also set up cost reports or budget alerts, uh, which are great uh, cost management tools that you should be taking advantage of. They can link projects, unlink projects, and manage all of the other users and permissions related to that billing account. Really important here, uh, like we talked about, Certain administrators of certain resources have special privileges and rights. And so for the billing account specifically, we require, we as in the billing support team, require any individuals reaching out to us to uh, ask about a, a billing account that that person be a billing account administrator on that particular account. Uh, reason for that is to protect our customers' privacy. We don't want to disclose any information to an individual that wouldn't otherwise have access to that information. So again, make sure that you have multiple billing administrators and also uh, let everyone know who those people are. If they have a question about billing, they're going to need to funnel that through the billing administrator. We have another, uh, we have another role up here, and there's, there's more than just these two, but we thought these were probably the most relevant. The billing account user. This person, a lot more limited in scope. They can basically view costs for the billing account, uh, and they can link projects into the billing account, but they can't unlink them. So this role is often granted in tandem with a project creator role. So it gives an uh, individual the ability to create a project and then fund that project by connecting it uh, back into the, to the billing account. Oftentimes, uh, people in organizations that we see filling the billing account administrator role are folks that are working in, in finance and accounting, or oftentimes you know, people that have P&L responsibility for a particular product line. So it could be someone in product management. All right. And with that, I'm going to pass things over to my colleague, Greg, who's going to talk to us about payment profiles. All right, so thank you, Max. So once again, my name is Greg Ian, and I'm a program manager on the billing support team. So before we get into talking about payments profiles, uh, just a quick show of hands. How many of you have actually heard of this resource before? Just a quick show of hands. What about the Google Payment Center? Literally, I think I see like three hands. <laughs> 
So this is great. This is great because as you can see, the payments profile sits outside of your GCP resources. And you need to understand why this is important because there's a huge connection between the payments profile and the billing account. We'll talk about uh, why it's important and why you should, be, uh, should take note of it. So the payments profile is actually managed in a completely different console. It's not managed in the GCP console. If you go to payments.google.com, you will actually see uh, what the payment center looks like. I want to include a screenshot um, because I want you all to be very well aware that the payments profile permissions and notifications are handled completely outside of the GCP console. There is some sections that are iframed into the GCP console, changing certain uh, email preferences, but however, the majority of settings should be handled at payments.google.com. So, the payments profile is a Google level resource. And what that means is that you utilize the payments profile to pay for your Google services beyond just GCP. So you could use your payments profile to pay for things like AdWords, GCP, Chrome, uh, Google Play. As it's a Google level resource, you are able to manage different payment methods within that payment profile. So if you're an online customer, you can manage things such as debit cards, credit cards, or bank account information. Within the payment center, think of it as your holistic location to view a lot of your invoices and documents. There's an actual section called the document center where you can see uh, credit memos, debit memos, and master agreements. But the thing to take away from the payments profile is that it is managed completely separate outside of your GCP console, and I think a lot of customers are not aware of this. So we'll talk about the implications of what it means to configure your payments profile correctly and how it can be successful for your organization. So when you're thinking about the payments profile, think of these four steps uh, to follow our best practices. Step one, create a business payments profile. A, payments, a business payments profile uh, allows you to go ahead and uh, enter your tax information. We are assuming uh, that your organization and business is treated as a separate legal entity. If you were to create an individual business payments profile, sorry, an individual payments profile, you would not have that functionality. But most importantly is that the business payments profile allows you to manage a lot of the permissions and email notifications for all of your users in your company. That doesn't happen with the individual payments profile. We recommend that you limit it to one uh, if possible. Very similar to billing accounts, uh, what we've seen in billing support is that whenever customers create multiple payments profiles and they call into GCP support, it's very hard to diagnose where the issue lies and which payment profile and which billing account right, could be uh, the root or could allow access to troubleshoot that issue. So we recommend it limit to one. There are different scenarios where you would have multiple uh, payments profiles and we'll, we'll walk through those scenarios later on in the presentation. Step two, set up your payments profile administrator. Now, we recommend that you mirror this payments profile administrator to be your billing account administrator, the exact same permissions if possible. For the reason that I stated is that if you call into billing support today, one of the ways that we authenticate and verify uh, you, as to, we verify you is that we ask you if you are the billing account administrator. Now, if the issue does lie with the payments profile, it's always best to ensure that you're the administrator of both of those resources so we can troubleshoot the, the issue from end to end. Step three, configure users to receive invoices and account notifications. We can't stress enough how many times we've seen fire drills for customers where you've got someone in accounts payable and you have someone in, in engineering and they're receiving different types of notifications based on the account. And when that happens is there's fire drills within organizations as to why is my bill not being paid? What's going on? How come I can't access these resources? So ensure that everybody is receiving the right level of notifications uh, and, most importantly, can pay the bill. Step four, add a secondary payment method. So we've seen historically that, you know, credit cards for online accounts, credit cards expire, right? Individuals leave organizations, and in doing so, sometimes your GCP resources do not get paid. So we recommend, please add a secondary payment method. So if the first one fails, you have a backup. 
for offline accounts, also known as uh, terms or invoice accounts, uh, we recommend that you have a secondary individual set up as a payments profile administrator. And on, not only that, but you also take a look, log into the center, and you can actually assign uh, individuals within your organization, such as finance, accounting, to just receive the invoice itself. We recommend that you review this every six months. Uh, you know, it's just good hygiene to have. Um, like I said, we understand that people go on uh, and do great things and leave organizations, so please just make sure this information is kept up to date. So the payments profile has two important roles they should take note of. One is the payments profile administrator. This individual has the keys to the kingdom. This individual can go ahead and change the actual business name, the legal address, different payment methods, change the entire notifications for everyone receiving invoice information. So it's important that this individual within an organization is someone who uh, usually has senior level uh, visibility into not only what your organization is interacting with Google from a GCP perspective, but across our entire portfolio of different products like ads or Google Play or Chrome. Now, if you don't want to give full access to a user, we understand that. You have the option of the read-only access. Now, the read-only access, as the name implies, is just for someone who just needs to see the invoices, just needs to see the transaction history. Historically, what we've seen is that an individual with this role will be someone in accounts finance, sorry, accounting, finance, or uh, accounts payable. All right, so switching gears to project folders and labels. So as Max had mentioned before, projects, folders, and labels are really uh, a flexible mechanism to help you with your cost management needs. It, they really, if they're structured correctly, they help you answer questions such as, how am I spending my GCP resources today? Or where can I uh, shift my resources to get the most use out of GCP? So project folders and labels. Projects, if you had to think of them, think of them as a bucket. And in this bucket, it stores a lot of service level resources. And these re service level resources could be, things as, could be things such as Kubernetes, compute, storage, and so on. Now, on top of those projects, you have folders. And the folders allow you to organize your resources in a logical way. What we've seen companies uh, utilize in a structure perspective is you can structure your folders to mean things such as um, environments, so your staging environment, your production environment, or you can even structure them to be actual teams, so your engineering team, your support team, et cetera. Labels, on the other hand, are great for being able to track your costs across GCP. Uh, if applied correctly, they'll allow you to answer a lot of your fundamental questions as to how much is application A spending from a maintenance perspective or from a development perspective. Um, so we encourage you to use labels. So when setting up these resources, we recommend these four things. One is organize your folders and proje projects to mirror your organization. Uh, we can't stress enough, please use a naming convention that works for your organization. While I personally think naming a project Cool Rider 87 makes sense, you know, someone in uh, finance might not be able to tie that purchase order to that invoice and might not be able to make sense of that project. So use something that makes sense for your organization. Step two, protect projects that are mission critical. We appreciate that all of you have placed a lot of trust onto GCP to run your mission critical projects. In order to respect that, we've created a functionality called placing a lien on a project. When you place a lien on a project, it prevents it from accidental deletion. This can be done through an API call, or it can even be done through a command line tool. Step three, add labels for more granular cost management. Now, as we said before, if you apply labels at the right level of resources, you can answer some of your most basic questions. You can even uh, answer as to how much are my database uh, costs uh, how much am I incurring from a database cost perspective across all my projects or specific to just one project? When creating these resources, these GCP resources, we recommend that through the workflow, you actually, there's a section where you can add a label to that resource early on. Now, if you already have your hierarchy set up, that's okay. You can actually retroactively go back and apply those labels to those resources. 
Step four, assign appropriate roles for folders and projects. We recommend that you use Cloud uh, Identity and Access Management, also known as Cloud IAM. So Cloud IAM allows you to centrally manage all of these permissions and identities and roles all at once. Uh, as an administrator, it's very difficult to be applying and removing permissions per each individual. But with Cloud IAM, you could do it holistically. But most importantly is that Cloud IAM allows you for audit and tracking purposes. So uh, for your organization, it might be very important to know who made the changes, who gave individual X, X you know, Y permission, and so on. Um, so it's good from a security and compliance standpoint. Now, with project folders and labels, we have two roles, one being the project creator role and the second being the project editor role. As the name implies, the project creator allows you to create projects. Uh, this individual will not only be able to create projects, but will also manage all of the service resources underneath it. At organizations, we've seen that an individual with this permission usually is in charge of developing the application. So it could be anyone from an engineering lead uh, to you know, a uh, project manager, uh, but someone who has, uh, who has access and visibility into budget cycles um, and so on. The second role is the project editor role. Now, if you don't want to give full permissions of being able to create projects willy-nilly around the organization, you can go ahead and give them the project editor role. And as the name implies, you can go ahead. The project editor allows you to uh, manage and edit the resources underneath that project. So. Uh, this is individual, usually at organizations, is someone such as a developer or uh, a project manager. So Max and I spent a great deal of time talking about all these different resources, right? And we figured that it would be important um, to provide some concrete examples as to how you can follow these best practices for your organization. We're actually going to walk through a startup called Digital Donut. Now, Digital Donut has figured out a way how to break down donuts into zeros and ones and send them over the internet. Completely revolutionary. And they're making waves. So what you see in this organizational structure is that it's very basic to follow a startup. You've got one organization, one project, some service resources underneath it, and a billing account and a payments profile. And with every startup, you've got a couple of individuals just working really hard to gain that next customer and grow the uh, actual business. So you have a founder and a developer. Now the founder uh, ends up becoming the organ, uh, organizational admin as well as the billing account admin and payments profile admin. The founder really wanted to let the developer focus on what they do best and that's developing the application for Digital Donut. So as you can see, the developer becomes the project administrator slash owner. And this developer is focused on building the chocolate application for Digital Donut. So as Digital Donut has expanded uh, beyond markets, they started realizing that there was more of a need uh, than just chocolate donuts. The founder ended up working with some industry analysts to go ahead and analyze their customer base. And they found that customers not only love chocolate donuts, but also jelly-filled donuts. So as you can see in this hierarchy, you've got project one and project two. Because the founder decided to build out a new product line, they hired an additional developer to become the project administrator. So here you've separated their responsibilities by product line, the chocolate uh, product line and the jelly product line. So project one is chocolate. Project two would be Jelly. Now, the founder has not had a chance to hire any additional resources, so they remain the org admin as well as the billing account and payments profile administrator. Now, Digital Donut has not only expanded from state to state, but it's just expanding all across the country. And with this expansion, as you can see, the organizational structure is starting to change. It's starting to morph. You see the introduction of folders, folder one and folder two. With this newfound success, the founder decided to hire a CTO. This chief technology officer comes from an organization that has deep expertise in business to business uh, to handle business to business markets. One of the things the CTO uh, started doing as they came into the organization was they wanted to understand 
and see if Digital Donut could move beyond a business to consumer market. And they found that there was a huge need to sell donuts to businesses at catering events. So folder one will be the business to consumer division. Folder two will be the business to business division. The engineer that started at the company has now moved up the ranks, ended up becoming an engineering lead, has a few folks working under, the, under them, and becomes the folder administrator. As the folder administrator, they have full rights and access to all of the projects, chocolate and glaze underneath that, and all of the service level resources underneath. But with that growth into the new business division, we hired an engineering manager. And this engineering manager is going to be tasked with building out the business to business division for Digital Donut. They become the folder to administrator slash owner. Also with his success, we hired a chief financial officer. As you can see, the chief financial officer becomes the billing account administrator and the payments profile admin. With this hire, the founder wanted to really understand how am I spending my GCP resources today? I'm growing out all these different product lines. I need to understand where am I spending the majority of my development costs, my maintenance costs, and so on. So the founder, the CTO, and the CFO got together and started applying labels. Now, as you can see, labels are being applied at the product level as well as the uh, service resource level underneath to measure the health of Digital Donut. So Digital Donut has not only expanded across the country, but now they're looking at global markets. And with these global markets, the founder and all the leadership started analyzing which markets would make sense for Digital Donuts. And they found that there was a huge need uh, and a huge market in the European uh, market. So as with this, instead of introducing a brand new product, they decided to acquire a company who had a similar business model, Digital Croissant. Now, Digital Croissant was a great acquisition because they also used GCP services. And with that, they brought their own leadership team, their own CTO, their own engineering leads and managers. Now, we discussed that in some slides back. We discussed that there were certain scenarios where it would make sense, where you would have multiple billing accounts and multiple payment profiles. And here's that example. Because Digital Donut functions in a US currency and has its own legal entity, it has its own billing account and payments profile. But Digital Croissant is functioning in a European market. They're going to be uh, having their own tax code uh, and acting as its own legal entity. They're going to be receiving separate documents, separate invoices. So it makes sense to have this structure today. But as you grow as an organization with every mergers and acquisitions, we recommend that eventually you start merging a lot of these organizations and folders and resources that make sense to your organization for the reason that it helps from a cost management perspective, from a security and permissions aspect as well. Now, with that consolidation, we noticed that the payments profile and billing account had no administrators during this mergers and acquisition. So we brought over our chief financial officer to also become the billing account two and payments profile two administrator. So what we wanted to do is provide some concrete examples of how to follow our best practices that we both mentioned today. Now, we understand that these examples might not mirror your organization, and that's OK. We understand that. But what we want to do is just provide you as many resources as possible and as many concrete exa examples as possible to make your organization successful. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it off back to Max. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. All right. So we covered a bunch of stuff today from domains, organizations, billing accounts, payments profiles, uh, projects, folders, and labels. Um, so we wanted to consolidate all of the best practices and tips that we had that were sort of interspersed throughout all of that. So we created the, this slide of goodness that you can take photos of. All right. Um, yeah, if you, you know, if you came in here with the best of intentions, you, you got your seat, you got your your paper and your, uh, your pen out, your tablet maybe, ready to take some notes, and then you immediately fell asleep and heard nothing that we said the entire time. That's okay. First off, good on you. It's a pretty, uh, pretty boss move. I respect that. Uh, second of all, that's fine. Because everything that we talked about 
and more, we included in a guide, guide to resource organization and access management. So we want to strongly encourage you, if you do one thing, if you take one thing away from today, um, check this out. Uh, go, go here when you have some time after next, in the next week, next couple weeks, with your team, with, with the core folks that are likely going to be in those administrative positions that we discussed, um, and walk through this with them. We have a, a checklist on each of the resources that we go into a lot more detail. We have a lot of you know, extra links on you know, additional information and references for all of the resources and, and sort of the guides and, and decisions, key decisions that you need to make. So please check this out. Um, and go through that.